2023 will go down in history as one of the biggest years for video games, for better and for worse. Now, it is game of the year time, so the last thing I want to do is get bogged down in negativity, but it also wouldn't feel right talking about the hits of the last 12 months without also recognizing that the people who make the games we love have had, and continue to have, a really rough time. Over 6,000 games jobs were lost by last October according to some sources, and since then we've seen even more layoffs from industry heavy hitters like Ubisoft and Bungie. Truly, my heart goes out to all of the game devs who experienced hard times over the past year or continue to face struggles going into 2024, and I just want to recognize that the excellence we're about to talk about wouldn't be possible without the talent and passion of these people. But ultimately, we are here to talk about the excellence of the year that was, and somehow, despite the constant turmoil the industry seems to be in, 2023 was a landmark year for critically acclaimed video games. A year that stands shoulder to shoulder with the likes of 1998 and 2009 where it seemed like every other month had a potential Game of the Year contender releasing to massive fanfare. Before we properly get stuck into my countdown of the top 10 best games of 2023, we've got some honourable mentions to cover. Games that, in a week a year, very well could have found themselves in the list proper. Cyberpunk 2077 it has been a rocky three years between Cyberpunk 2077's initial bug-ridden mechanically hollow release and its 2.0 update and Phantom Liberty DLC, but CD Projekt Red have really turned that game around. Even at its most functional, vanilla Cyberpunk 2077 was an incredibly bland experience, and the state it launched in left such a bad taste in my mouth that I was apprehensive about giving it another shot, ever. I'm glad my fiancé convinced me otherwise, however, because the 2.0 update transformed the base game into one of the most satisfying build crafting experiences I've had in a single player RPG. Storming through Night City, bashing in skulls, tossing goons into the stratosphere and unleashing hell with heavy weapons was the purest kind of fun, and the potential of the system even had me doing multiple runs to experiment with different weapons and skills. Then you add Phantom Liberty's neo-noir espionage thriller into the mix with its somehow shittier chunk of Night City to explore and an expanded cast of memorable characters and side stories to interact with, and Cyberpunk 2077, to my surprise, becomes one of the best games of 2023. Except it came out in 2020. Assassin's Creed Mirage I've thought for a while now that the Assassin's Creed franchise either needs a long time out of the spotlight, or a scaled back production, or both, and I'm taking Assassin's Creed Mirage as a personal win in that regard. Is it the best AC game? Not even close, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. Mirage brought the franchise back to a more stealth focused gameplay style and dialed its ludicrously sized map riddled with forgettable content down to something more manageable and more interesting. Individual missions and sequences don't feel like interchangeable filler anymore, but more like tailored assassination assignments where you have to scope out your targets and their locations to complete your task. Also, Assassin's Creed Mirage still gets caught up in the franchise's overwhelming plot weirdness near the end, so it's not perfect, but it's still pretty down to earth for the most part, which makes it so much easier to engage with. Like I said, it's not perfect by any means, but I do think it's the shot in the arm that the franchise needs to be interesting again. Stray Gods Stray Gods, the role-playing musical, is certainly unique. That sounds like I'm damning it with faint praise, but I really do think it's pretty cool, even if I don't necessarily agree with the definition of role-playing game Stray Gods seems to be using. Built more like a musical visual novel, Stray Gods lets you pick what lines its protagonist sings and how she sings them in all of its decently entertaining musical numbers, and that's genuinely pretty impressive. Like, the way I understand it, the melodies, lyrics, and styles of music you experience throughout a single playthrough of Stray Gods works almost like a branching decision tree that other, more traditional RPGs might work around, and that sounds like some artistic wizardry to me. Using this as a base, Stray Gods utilizes world-building ideas that are super intriguing, a charming hand-drawn art style, and outstanding voice acting to deliver an experience worth checking out, even if its whole visual novel deal isn't necessarily my bag. Super Mario Wonder I'm not sure in the year 2023 that a side-scrolling Mario title is really going to catch me off guard. I didn't get a lot of time with Super Mario Wonder, so it hasn't really hit me as hard as it has with a lot of other critics, but I do think it's worth an honourable mention for a couple of reasons. For starters, it's a really fun Mario side-scroller with a lot of fresh ideas and mechanics, which can be hard to come by in the side-scrolling Mario market. More importantly, however, is that the game has so much visible personality which has been sorely lacking since the DS cursed us with the sterile, uninteresting new Super Mario aesthetic 18 years ago. 
Super Mario Wonder is high up in my backlog for quiet periods this year, and a large part of that is because it's just so charming to look at. So if those are some of the games that didn't make the cut, then you better believe we have some absolute bangers to get to. But as always, this is my game of the year list, so I won't be talking about games that I didn't get to, or games that I didn't like, so I don't want to hear anyone asking where Starfield is, alright? But I would love to hear about the games that you guys loved last year, so please feel free to share your games of the year in the comments below. Now without any further ado, let's get into it, my top 10 games of 2023. Number 10. Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Sometimes all I want from a sequel to a game I love is more. Now that might just mean more of the same gameplay stretched out over a new game's runtime, but my favourite kind of more is what Star Wars Jedi Survivor provides. At a base level, Jedi Survivor brings a lot of what its predecessor brought to the table. Challenging and hard-hitting lightsaber combat, exploration platforming that's enhanced by a good variety of traversal skills, and a story that feels able to stand on its own but also offers plenty of fan service. If it just offered that again, I'd still really enjoy Star Wars Jedi Survivor, but Respawn had other ideas. They drilled down on the aspects of Fallen Order that worked and expanded upon them to the point where Fallen Order feels a little limited in retrospect. Jedi Survivor brings greater depth to combat with more variety in stances and moves, as well as a wider range of enemies and challenges to take on, while in the platforming department the game provides some top tier traversal gauntlets to put its newer platforming skills to the test. Even Jedi Survivor's story builds on the original in a surprising and compelling way without relying too hard on fanservice, although when it does hit the fanservice button, shit really goes off. Jedi Survivor had a rough launch, just like Fallen Order before it coincidentally, but like its predecessor, it does so much right that it's hard to not celebrate the game in the end. Number 9. Viewfinder Since Portal's release a good 17 or so years ago, I've been on the lookout for clever little puzzle games with deceptively simple core mechanics every year. Portal, The Witness, Superliminal, all games that had me thinking surely this can't carry an entire game, before blowing my mind with how much gameplay you can wring out of a truly creative mechanic. And while it may not reach the same heights as a Witness or a Portal, Viewfinder is really inventive and mind-blowing in a lot of the right ways. The mechanical premise is that you're able to manipulate the environment through the use of images, starting off simply by asking you to eliminate or navigate obstructions with images you find in the game's levels, before eventually asking you to reorient images that you find, or manipulate perspective by taking photos yourself and using those images to solve puzzles. Every time I thought I'd seen the extent to which Viewfinder could push this core image manipulation mechanic, it managed to surprise me with a new twist or limitation to keep things fresh. If I have any issues with the game, it's that Viewfinder is a little short and its story feels like window dressing. But I do have to say, the game's brisk runtime prevents the novelty of its gimmick from wearing off, and even if it feels inessential, Viewfinder's story doesn't feel phoned in. Ultimately though, I'm here for the unique core mechanic and the aha moment that comes from clever puzzle design, and Viewfinder is magical from start to end in that regard. Number 8. Street Fighter 6 While I enjoy fighting games well enough, I'm not sure I'd ever call myself a fighting game guy, but Street Fighter 6 might have changed that. Don't get me wrong, I love games like Mortal Kombat and Tekken, but I'm usually there for the over-the-top story and wild spectacle, and not the joy of fighting games themselves, and Street Fighter 6 still has a lot of that stuff that I love. There's plenty of insane special moves and wild visual flair. Hell, it even has an incredibly goofy story mode, which I really appreciated as a way to ease myself into it. But Street Fighter VI is probably the first time I've gone beyond that surface level enjoyment of a fighting game. I picked a main, I put in lab time with them, I played online. I've never been one for competitive online play in fighting games, but Street Fighter VI does such a great job of teaching both character specifics and genre fundamentals that I ended up feeling confident enough to actually take the fight online. It also doesn't hurt that when I did play online, Street Fighter VI still felt really good. Even with my so-so Australian internet, the game's network was up to the task of providing stable matches almost all the time. I can't recall the last time I had so much fun with a fighting game, seriously. Street Fighter VI looks great, it feels great, it's got a decently varied roster and it actually made me feel like I could really get into competitive fighting games, which is maybe the highest praise I could level at it.
Number 7. Resident Evil 4 Remake Did Resident Evil 4 need a full remake? I'm not sure. I'm not against seeing a fresh take on a genre-defining classic, but despite being old enough to legally drink in Australia, there's very few wrinkles in RE4 that a coat of HD paint wouldn't iron out. So while I do question the logic behind the full remake, I can't say I'd rather it didn't exist, because Resident Evil 4 Remake is fantastic. A lot of that is due to a major shift in tone. While RE4 Remake does still have some silliness, like the little Napoleon-ass villain and the recurring Australian merchant, it is definitely not as goofy as the original. In fact, it's downright terrifying in places, owing in large part to a vast shift in direction and a darker, grittier visual style. On the gameplay side of things, RE4 Remake is similar to the original, but noticeably tighter, in line with the other phenomenal RE remakes, and in general, encounters feel much more frantic and intense. This might make the prospect of babysitting Ashley sound daunting, but playing bodyguard is actually far less annoying than the original could be. Not only is the remake more forgiving with her escort style of play, but actually controlling her is a way more interesting sequence than in the original too, with its own unique gameplay gimmick and everything. Overall, Resident Evil 4 Remake might be the smoothest gameplay experience of the year. Between the shift in tone, the modernization of its gameplay, and a slew of new additions, such as the arcade-style blue medallion quests scattered throughout the campaign, Resident Evil 4 may not feel necessary, or even supplant the original for me personally, but it does feel different enough to warrant its own existence, and as a gameplay experience, it's almost untouchable this year. Number 6. Hi-Fi Rush Around a year ago when I was making last year's Game of the Year video, I mentioned looking forward to Hi-Fi Rush, calling it a weird rhythm action game that looked cool. And I was right! Hi-Fi Rush is a weird rhythm action game and it is cool as all hell. Brought to us by the makers of The Evil Within and Ghostwire Tokyo, of all developers, Hi-Fi Rush is a game that looks at the modern action game, sees the rhythm inherent in the genre, and says, fuck it, let's just make it a rhythm game. And surprise surprise, the combination actually works so well. Attacking on the beat for higher damage and executing timed button press finishes is exceedingly satisfying, and the way enemies attack in time with the music also makes it feel incredibly natural to parry or avoid incoming damage. I really can't get over how obvious the rhythm action mashup is, or how perfectly it meshes together. The rhythm mashup even extends beyond the combat, with plenty of level elements moving in time with any given level's music, which plays into Hi-Fi Rush's simple platforming between fights. Not only does that spice up some otherwise basic traversal, it also adds a nice visual touch, with non-platforming elements of the world also bopping along to the game's soundtrack. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. I haven't even mentioned the colourful, cel-shaded visuals that make the game a joy to look at, or the varied gimmick-heavy boss fights and their accompanying licensed tracks like One Million by Nine Inch Nails that punctuate Hi-Fi Rush's levels with plenty of personality. Hi-Fi Rush was one of the most pleasant surprises of the year, and absolutely must be in the conversation for Game of the Year. Number 5. Marvel's Spider-Man 2 When Marvel's Spider-Man was released for the PS4 in 2018, I was blown away. Not since Arkham Asylum had a video game so perfectly captured the essence of a comic book hero and how playing as them should feel. Spider-Man Miles Morales would serve as a solid introduction to a new Spidey with some new Spidey skills, but a full-on numbered sequel was always going to be an uphill battle. Somehow though, Spider-Man 2 soars above its predecessor, quite literally in some cases. At a glance, the most noticeable difference between Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2 is the inclusion of a second playable Spider-Man, but while taking the original and spin-off games and mashing them together would have made for a fine game, it isn't what I think makes Spider-Man 2 a Game of the Year contender. No, it's in the details that Spider-Man 2 really earns my admiration. Insomniac have refined the original's gadget system to make combat feel more fluid and less bogged down, they've added web wings to both Spider-Men to let you glide through the city at immense speeds, and they've introduced special moves related to both traversal and combat to keep things interesting. Honestly, I never in a million years expected Insomniac to improve upon their already stellar traversal mechanics for Spider-Man, but Spider-Man 2's New York City never stops being a thrill to navigate. Also, the plot of these Insomniac games continues to be far more compelling and enjoyable depictions of the web-slinger than I had ever expected, with plenty of new takes on established comic book canon to keep fans of the property guessing. Spider-Man 2 is such a great addition to the Insomniac library, and I can't wait for that New Game Plus update to give me an excuse to play it again. I just- I need more Spider-Man, okay? Okay, before we get down to business, there's 
something I have to tell you. I'm fresh out of honey. Number 4. The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom I don't think it's hyperbole to say that The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was a groundbreaking entry in the Zelda franchise, whether you loved it or thought it was overrated. I fell somewhere in the middle. I liked Breath of the Wild a lot, had some issues with it, but ultimately recognized that the systems within its world and the way they interacted with players and their available toolsets was groundbreaking. The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom feels like another leap in systemic game design, with the development team introducing a brand new set of tools for players to interact with the world through. Allowing players to drag and drop practically every item in the world, fuse them together, and even combine them to make incredible machines is just one of the frankly miraculous gameplay elements that Tears of the Kingdom has to offer. Being able to reverse the motion of individual objects or ascend through surfaces seems quaint by comparison, but these systems all interact in ways that must have taken some real dark magic to actually pull off. Now, some folks might complain about Tears of the Kingdom's asset reuse, but when there is so much going on under the hood, I find that pretty trivial. Especially since the old map also features a sky and subterranean map to explore with just so much to find in each. The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is a true feat of systemic design, and few games enable player creativity like it. Also, not for nothing, but the tools that Tears of the Kingdom provide might have contributed to the funniest moments I've had with video games all year. Maybe ever. Number 3. Dredge As it turns out, I'm a huge fan of quaint, unassuming sim games with horrific twists. I was smitten by Cult of the Lamb last year, and in 2023, few games had me charmed like I was with Dredge. On the surface, Dredge is a nice, relaxing fishing game. You potter around the seas on your little fishing trawler, searching for spots to fish at or haul up sunken wrecks before selling your catch and using your salvage to upgrade your equipment and do it all again, but better and faster. The gameplay consists of simple timing-based minigames, and it's all rather pleasant. But beneath the surface, Dredge has something more sinister lurking. You burn daylight with every mile you sail and line you cast, and before long you'll find yourself alone out there in the pitch black night. And with that darkness comes madness. Are you really alone? Were those rocks always there? And is that a ship out there in the night, or...? Past the charming low-poly art of the environment and initially friendly premise, Dredge is actually a horror game. Impressionist portraits of the game's townsfolk give them an air of underlying creepiness, and the sanity effects inflicted on you by spending too much time in the dark makes it clear you should not go out at night. Except your job and the quest to solve Dredge's overarching mysteries often requires risking the darkness. Risking the madness. I feel like the less I really say about Dredge's plot, the better, so I'll leave it at this. I love the game's sense of intrigue and mystery. I love the Lovecraftian influences behind its sanity effects and horribly fucked up monster fish designs. I love the underlying tension behind this otherwise calming gameplay loop. I really love Dredge. Number 2. Alan Wake 2 there's just no other studio like Remedy in the games industry, and Alan Wake 2 is a perfect example of something that only they could have made. Alan Wake 2 is so many things. It's a survival horror game. It's a series of short films. It's a 15 minute musical. It's a manuscript whose quality knowingly implies that the author is actually kind of a hack. It's a series of commercials made by and starring a pair of Finnish brothers. Alan Wake 2 is all of these things an achievement in multimedia creativity that manages to unnerve and delight in almost equal measure. There are just so many things to gush about with Alan Wake 2. The music is top notch, whether we're talking about the thematically appropriate end chapter songs, the tone setting ambience that keeps you on edge, or the wild metal stylings of the old gods of Asgard, the game's in-universe rock band. The visuals from the shitty TV commercials of the Koskala brothers and the unnerving flashes of screaming faces used to scare the hell out of you, to the beautifully rendered bright falls and its terrifying abyss-like forests are executed perfectly. If there is anywhere that Alan Wake 2 comes up short, it's that its combat maybe isn't as tight as it was in the first game, but that makes sense in the shift to survival horror. It's less responsive overall, yes, but that kind of helps encounters feel more tense and frantic. 
Supplementing those frantic encounters are world-bending environmental puzzles, deeply upsetting enemy designs, unexpectedly cool visual effects, and a story that kept me guessing right up until the very end. And the best part? It has a New Game Plus update, so I have a really convincing reason to dive into that ocean that is Alan Wake 2 again soon. Number 1. Baldur's Gate 3 Calling Baldur's Gate 3 a generational classic feels right on the money. I don't know the ins and outs of its development, but it feels both tremendously complex and utterly effortless all at once. Larian Studios have absolutely knocked this one out of the park. With the sheer amount of choice available to players, from build options to dialogue trees, Baldur's Gate 3 constantly caught me off guard with just how much it accounts for. For instance, referencing your character's background and conversation is purely cosmetic in practice, but it adds plenty of personality to even the smallest of interactions. Conversely, gameplay choices in hour 4 or 5 of this potentially 100 hour epic may have ramifications hours and hours down the line, long after you've stopped thinking about the initial choice in question. And at a more moment to moment level, Baldur's Gate 3 is just an absolute joy to play. Tactical, turn based battles based on D&D 5th edition work wonderfully and manage to scratch the tabletop RPG itch like few others can. Like, there's so much dumb shit you could do to progress in this game. If you think something might work in combat, there's a good chance that it probably will. And the plot, where to even start? Baldur's Gate 3 takes the setting of the Forgotten Realms and displays it in all its weirdness, hooking players with an unfolding tale of gods and otherworldly threats, but keeping them engaged with a cast of lovable misfits whose individual tales of lost power and control make them endlessly compelling in their own right. And it helps that they're voice acted superbly. It speaks volumes that this game takes between 80 to 100 hours to finish, yet across PC and PS5 I've easily spent 400 hours playing Baldur's Gate 3, and there's still more I haven't experienced. No game is as deserving of the Game of the Year nod in 2023 as Baldur's Gate 3 is. And there you have it, my top 10 games of the year for 2023. It has been an absolute classic year for video games, but for every masterpiece I played, there were another two or three games that I didn't even get a chance to touch. So if your favorites didn't end up on here, I'd love to see you talk about them in the comments below. What exceeded your expectations? What didn't live up to the hype? What surprised you? And while you're down there, let me know what games you are hyped for in 2024. Maybe you're looking forward to the Suicide Squad game, or Machine Games' Indiana Jones project. My year is already off to one hell of a start, with Prince of Persia The Lost Crown storming out of the gates, and I'm personally keen to sink my teeth further into that. Speaking of, that's my cue to wrap this up. Until next time, I've been Josh the Top Hat Gamer, wishing you all the best for 2024. Kakite, take care, bye bye. <laughs>